we are now looking forward to a presentation by Kate Sills. Kate is an Agoric, uh, is, uh, works at Agoric and is a Foresight Fellow, and she's been really exploring how crypto commerce approaches um, can apply to some of the economic institutions that we discussed throughout the first part of the book that are so um, fundamental for the cooperative arrangements uh, that we have and that we want to continue uh, to build out into the future. And she'll be presenting today on NFT approaches for engineering property rights. And I'm super curious to discuss maybe afterwards in, uh, in the off the record discussion um, or, 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 or later, how it A relates to the more cryptographic uh, land title registries that we discussed in the earlier chapters uh, that Anando de Soto pointed out were really uh, tremendously beneficial for unlocking uh, a lot of the um, yeah, informal sector's capital and contributing that to the economy. But then I'm also really interested in discussing how it relates to potentially more future facing problems that we'll tackle in two chapters down the road, which is the problem of how can we um, maybe create a blockchain based property rights to, uh, regime for uh, the division of uh, future space resources as a universal basic capital for humanity. Um, and so that's a mouthful, but maybe we could tackle that or foreshadow that already. Maybe not, but we'll get to it eventually. For now, I'm super, super happy to have uh, Kate here. Uh, Kate, um, um, please take it away. The stage is yours. I'll share more info about you in the chat. All right. Well, thank you so much. Uh, let me just share my screen here. Okay. Uh, can everyone see that? Awesome. Yes. All right. All right, thank you everyone. Um, I'm Kate Sills. I'm a software engineer at Agoric and I'm the engineering lead on our smart contract framework. And today I'm gonna to be talking about something a little bit different that I hope that you haven't heard about before. And it's something that I'm actually particularly worried about. And it's at the intersection of law and economics and blockchain. And that is NFTs and engineering property rights. But first, let's start with our current legal system. So in the US, we have freedom of contract. You and I can make a contract about nearly anything. So for example, Michael Jordan famously had a contract with the Chicago Bulls that had a quote, love of the game clause that allowed him to play basketball anytime and anywhere he wanted. So normally NBA players were prohibited from playing basketball outside the NBA because of the, because of the risk of potential injury. So like I said, contracts can be about nearly anything, as long as it's not criminal. But property law is very different. Property law is limited. There's a limited number of standard forms that will be enforced by the legal system. So for instance, if I make a deal with Michael Jordan saying that he's allowed to play basketball on my property at any time, even after I sell it, that will not be enforced by the courts. And the only difference from the Michael Jordan love of the game clause is that now we're talking about property, not contract. So you might be asking, why is that? Why is property law so different from contract law? And the answer is that property rights are in rem, meaning that they're rights in a thing. It's the right to exclude the world from a thing that you own. Contract rights, by contrast, are in personam. They apply to particular people. So what does this mean? So as a person in society, I have to be aware of the boundaries of other people's property, whether that's land or other kinds of property rights, cars, books, what have you. But other people's contracts are their business and that shouldn't affect me. So why does property have a limited number of forms? Well, it turns out that new forms of property can lead to higher transaction costs for everyone else because everyone else is affected. So let's go over an example. So normally when two parties buy or sell something, it doesn't have a huge negative effect on everyone else. So let's say that Alice sells a baseball card to Bob. All of the other buyers and sellers in the baseball card market are pretty much unaffected. Maybe the price changes slightly, but that's it. Now let's say that Alice creates a new kind of property right. Alice takes her baseball card and decides to sell ownership of the card per day of the week. So you can own the card on a Monday, someone else can own it on Tuesday, and someone else can own it on Wednesday. 
So let's say that Alice sells the quote unquote Monday right to Bob. Now, if Carol is buying a baseball card from Bob, she has to ask Bob if she's buying ownership just for Mondays or whether it's the rights to the whole card, the usual rights that you would have to a baseball card. So now, even if you aren't interacting directly with Alice or Bob, the search costs, the time that you spend investigating whether a deal is right for you have gone way up. For every baseball card that you want to buy, you have to make sure that there's no weird side agreement in property law, these are called fancies, attached to it. So adding fancies makes the search costs for everyone else go up because they have to make sure that fancies aren't attached to the property before they buy it. So let's talk more about search costs. Search costs are a type of transaction costs. Transaction costs are search and information costs, plus bargaining costs, plus enforcement costs, plus any other kind of friction. So search costs is specifically the time, energy, and money expended when buyers and sellers try to find each other and assess what they might buy. Bargaining cost is the uh, cost of coming to an agreement and enforcement cost is the cost of enforcing or ensuring that the agreement is kept. So we've gone over the difference between property and contract law and transaction costs, and we've explained why the law allows for idiosyncratic forms of property, or sorry, forms of contract, but not property. And that is because property is a right against the world. And because property is a right against the world, a new form affects everyone else negatively by increasing transaction costs specifically search costs. Okay, so now we get into the blockchain space. How does this translate into the blockchain space? Well, blockchains allow for the creation of property that is virtual intangible property and the decentralized enforcement of transfer. So as many of you may know, there's two major types of virtual property on a blockchain. The first is fungible, as in the case of cryptocurrencies. So for fungible tokens, 20 tokens are indistinguishable from 20 other tokens of the same kind. The second kind of tokens is known as non-fungible tokens or NFTs. So these are often used for collectible items such as the CryptoKitty seen here. And the main distinguishing factor is that a non-fungible token has a unique identifier, whereas fungible tokens do not. And I should note here that fungibility in the economic sense is in the eye of the beholder. So if you want a CryptoKitty and you don't really care which one you get, then all CryptoKitties are fungible with each other according to your perspective. So the economic meaning of fungibility is different than the technical distinction here. So we've covered property on a blockchain, but what about contracts? So blockchains have a thing called smart contracts. A smart contract is code that runs on a blockchain that either produces virtual property or transfers virtual property, or some mix thereof. And importantly, it does so according to the rules specified in the code. And a smart contract is very different than a legal contract in that the enforcement mechanism of a smart contract is possession of the virtual property by the code itself. So what do I mean by this? As an example, let's look at a time-locked smart contract. So let's say that Bob owns some tokens, he sends the tokens to the time locked contract. Now the contract has sole possession of the tokens. Bob has no access. And per the code of the contract, the smart contract releases the token only after the expiration date. The expiration date passes and the token is released back to Bob. So you can see there's a number of really unusual things here. First, uh, Bob is the only party. Bob is binding his own future actions. This is not something that a court would normally enforce. Uh, these contracts would be known as Ulysses contracts and they're not enforceable in a court. So this is very unusual. Um, second, the enforcement mechanism, as I mentioned, is that Bob is actually handing over possession of the token to the code itself. So a similar thing happens with commercial trades on a blockchain. Let's say that Alice and Bob want to trade their tokens with each other. They can do so securely by passing their tokens into the smart contract which takes possession of both sides of the trade, swaps and releases them to Alex and Bob. So let's go back to the baseball card on Monday's example. How would this work on a blockchain? So now let's say that the baseball card that Alice owns is a virtual baseball card or an NFT. 
So Alice sells Bob the right to her virtual baseball card, but just on Mondays. So how does she do that? Well, if Alice gives Bob her card on a Monday, Bob is now the full owner as far as the blockchain is concerned, and Bob can run away with the card. Alice won't ever get it back. So instead, the blockchain way to do something, uh, to do this is something like this. Alice sends her virtual baseball card to a smart contract. The contract keeps her card in escrow and gives her back seven new cards, one for each of the days of the week. So Alice can sell the Monday card to Bob and keep the rest for herself. So this is where it gets really interesting. So in a smart contract, we don't see the same kind of negative externality. Everyone else who wants to buy a baseball card is unaffected by Alice's decision to split her card into seven pieces. So what makes this blockchain case different from the real world case? Well, the new days of the week cards are actually a new type of token. On Agoric, that's what we would call a new brand of token. So that means that it's very easy to distinguish between the original cards and Alice's monstrosity of a new property form. So when someone just wants to buy a baseball card, their search for the card will leave out Alice's new tokens. And then additionally, because enforcement in smart contracts requires possession, the smart contract still holds the original NFT, but in a way that's inaccessible to anyone else. And so inaccessible to the market. So there's no chance of someone accidentally coming across it. So in a smart contract on a blockchain, we can create new forms of property without increasing search costs. But we have another problem, and that is fragmentation. So the, pro the problem of fragmentation is also known as the tragedy of the anti-commons. And I'm sure you've all heard of the tragedy of the commons in which a resource held in common is overused. So this is the opposite. The opposite, this is underuse. And it occurs when too many people own pieces of one thing, then no one can use it. Because to use the thing, bargaining costs are extremely high because each separate owner of the pieces has to be negotiated with. So here's an example of the tragedy of the anti-commons that many of you might be familiar with. And that is building property in the Bay Area. New buildings are almost always vetoed by one person or another, so it's nearly impossible. So going back to our days of the week NFT, imagine if all of the owners of all of the parts had to agree before the card could be used. So for example, let's imagine that Alice wants to put the original baseball card back together. How would we do that? So in a smart contract on a blockchain, the technical mechanism would be that you buy up all of the pieces, send them back to the original smart contract, and then the original contract burns the pieces and sends your NFT back. But what happens when you can't collect all seven? What if some people don't want to sell? What if they hold out for more money knowing that six out of the seven pieces is not helpful to you and you actually need all seven? This is known as the holdout problem in economics. So in real life, we have a few ways of trying to get around the holdout problem, but it is a huge problem. With smart contracts, though, we can intentionally design the new tokens to prevent this problem. And one potential solution is NFTs that expire. So when the smart contract makes the seven new pieces, those pieces can have an expiration date, expiration date at which time they will no longer be recognized. And after the expiration date, the contract can safely send the original baseball card NFT back to Alice. So Alice does not have to bargain with all of the owners of the pieces of her baseball card. A well-designed property right will solve the problems of fragmentation. So in conclusion, property or smart contracts on a blockchain create a new field where software engineering or designing NFTs is actually engineering property rights. Smart contracts and virtual property are tools that property rights engineers can use tools for creating, splitting, and combining property in new ways. And importantly, in a smart contract, anyone can alter and create new property rights without imposing high transaction costs on everyone else. But that is only if we know and design around the economic problems that can occur with property rights. So I think this is fascinating. And I hope if you're an economist or a software engineer, you think so too. Thank you so much.